Yeah, thanks, Manny. And thanks again to the organizers. Um, it's challenging times to host a workshop. So I really appreciate all the effort going into this. Um, so like Manny said, I'm going to be talking about uh, primarily diurnal warm layers and how that influences the upper ocean turbulence. Um, I'll note my list of co-authors here, and you'll notice my name's small, uh, and that's because it's the material I'm going to be presenting really relies on an incredible group of students and postdocs who have made their way through OSU over the last several years. Um, primarily, I'll be showing results from Aureli Mulan, who is a PhD student at OSU, but she's now a scientist at APL UW. And then Ken Hughes, who was a postdoc at OSU, he's still at OSU in a research scientist position. Um, and then I'll close by showing some more recent work by Rita Brada Thakar, who uh, Shrilika just showed some of the work he did as a PhD. He's now a postdoc at University of Michigan. And then Sadant uh, Karaka, probably messed up his last name, apologies, Sid, um, who is a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts. And then um, this work is also in collaboration with Deepak Charian and Jim Moom and Bill Smythe at OSU. So on this page is an idealized schematic that Ken put together of diurnal. Oh, Emily, I'm sorry. Oh, if yeah. you don't mind, as questions come by in the chat box, uh, I will interrupt. Is that okay? That is absolutely yeah. okay. Please interrupt. I love um, a kind of dialogue more than just me talking at you. Yeah. So. Sorry, I missed it in the beginning. Please go no, ahead. No, that's Thank excellent. You. Thanks, Mani. Um, so this is an idealized schematic that Ken put together. It's a classic problem that's been studied for a long period of time. Um, if you look at the back panel, he's schematically in, uh, representing the incoming heat flux at the surface of the ocean. And so during the day, we have um, net ocean heating, and there's this penetrating solar radiation component. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but I'll probably use it anyway. Um, and, and that causes a yeah. buildup of temperature we in the upper here. ocean. Oh, excellent. Thanks. And then at night, that's followed by a period of cooling of the ocean. Um, and, you know, under constant to weak winds is sort of what he's imagining here, because during um, those conditions, turbulence really isn't sufficient to uh, completely mix away that thermal stratification structure. And then in the foreground, he's plotting the temperature stratification and the blue colors that develops with the diurnal warm layer through the course of the day. And then the vectors represent um, what happens to the velocity. So because we have constant to weak winds and we have a very shallow stratification layer, that momentum is trapped near the surface and we get what is called a diurnal jet developed through the course of a day. And then you can see the progression of that diurnal jet um, and you'll notice that it's rotating. And so if you're off equatorial regions, you will um, inertially veer that current through the course of the day. Okay, so in today's talk, I'm gonna go over just a little bit of background. Like I said, it's a long um, studied problem um, and I'll touch on some of that. Part of that will also be looking at the global significance of why we would care about um, the diurnal warm layer and turbulence at the base of it. Um, I'll talk about ship-based measurements that we've been using in the last several years to get a good picture of the very near surface. It's not a super easy problem to do from a ship. Um, and then we'll look at the development of stratification shear and turbulence at, from observations of the ocean. Um, talk a little bit about stratified shear instability in the diurnal warm layer and then the consequences of turbulence. Um, and then I wanna close by again, citing uh, some more recent work by um, Rita Brat and Sid who are continuing to look at this problem in the Bay of Bengal. So here you see a time series from the equatorial Indian Ocean. Um, this was the dynamo experiment. It shows um, sort of our simple understanding of uh, what a diurnal warm layer looks like. It's a nice problem because it's repeatable. If you have uh, you know, steady atmospheric conditions, um, you have the daily cycle of warming and heating. It's one dimensional. If there's not variability in the horizontal, you just have to worry about the development in the vertical. And because of that, it's it's a nice problem to study. Um, and there's just a few interesting twists to maybe our typical stratified shear turbulence setups in that it's very near a boundary. Um, and then there's also this penetrating radiative heat source, uh, which makes it a little interesting. So here is a sequence of five days. The top panel shows the incoming solar, uh, the incoming net radiation. Um, so this is the you know cooling at night and heating during the day cycle you see here. The second panel is the wind stress. And so you can see um, 
In general, it's kind of weak to moderate winds, so we're up to about 0.1 newton per meter squared, which is probably close to 10 meters per second, 10 meter winds. And then particularly on the ninth, I believe, picture is blocking my screen. Um, yeah, on October 9th, you can see that the weak winds are associated with very strong warming. And so the temperature record in the ocean is plotted in the second panel. Um, these are actually the locations where we were measuring temperature. And then the bottom panel is showing just the uh, extrapolated version um, between those measurements. And so you can see that on this um, low wind day, we get temperatures in excess of um, a half degree Celsius from the nighttime values. Um, and then, you know, the, the signal is pretty typical. You see near surface warming, you see maybe a little bit of a lag, and then the progression and deepening of the diurnal warm layer as the day progresses. Okay, let's make sure I touched on all of these points over here. So the key is, is oh, going back a few things is we really only see strong diurnal warm layers and weak to moderate winds. Um, and in the other pieces that you need kind of clear sky conditions, right? So there are, you know, there is some sensitivity to where you might expect to see strong diurnal warm layers. Um, and then going on to the next little bit of information. Um, so I wanted to briefly touch on some of the background here. And in particular, uh, looking a little bit at the Price Weller Pinkle paper from 1986, which is really, um, you know, the study of the diurnal warm layer preceded this, but uh, this is a classic in terms of our understanding of the modeling of the diurnal warm layer. And so here are some data. Uh, Emily, from... there, there is a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Sri Leka asks, uh, why is the warming more enhanced on 9th October? It's the weak winds. So if you go and look at just like the subtle dip in the magnitude of the wind stress, this makes a large difference in the magnitude of the diurnal warm layer. Um, actually, as the talk progresses, I'll talk a little bit about um, when we might actually even expect to see a diurnal warm layer that's almost laminar. Um, and so you get really strong heating during those conditions. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the last slide showed the stratification from um, a recent dish record in the equatorial Indian Ocean. Um, I wanted to, from the Priceweller Pinkle study, pull up a record of velocity. Um, and so here they're plotting the temperature on the back panel, and then the vectors are velocity. This is from um, it's kind of a unique platform, the research platform FLIP, which is a very stable um, toad body that then you can take measurements from. And so this is a data set off of California at about 30 north. Um, and so the top is early morning or about sunset, and then um, the day progresses as you go around clockwise in the image. And so you can see, you know, pretty uniform temperature at the beginning of the day, um, a uniform current. And then as the uh, day progresses, you start to see heating near the surface and you start to see the development of this diurnal jet um, and then the steering or the veering of that diurnal jet um, through inertial processes. Um, so a couple of points to note. One is that there's a similar depth scale for the temperature and momentum, and there's a distinct maximum in those fields around um, 2 p.m. local. Uh, so that, and then after that period, you start to see a weakening of the shear and stratification. Um, I've already mentioned the veering by the Coriolis force. The magnitude of the diurnal jet tends to be about 10 centimeters per second, although of course it varies depending on the, um, the setup. There is strong variability associated with day-to-day -day, um, conditions in terms of primarily the winds, but also the heating. Obviously you need to have um, net warming during the day that, that needs to be significant. And then, you know, this study is where we, um, where the Price Weller Pinkle or PWP mixed layer model um, was developed based off of um, primarily a scaling consideration of how much the temperature and velocity were perturbed um, on a daily basis. Just to note um, for this particular time series here, the temperature um, deviation is also about of a tenth of a degree during the day. And then I thought this was a really nice 
quote um, that, you know, this is from the Price Waller Pinkle paper, but they're pulling this idea from um, Stommel 1969 paper. Um, I have to move everyone's heads, or I guess just my head uh, again, but um, the, the new diurnal warm cycle is then written upon a clean slate, which has no important memory of the previous day's stratification or velocity. So again, the idea that this is a repeatable experiment um, in the environment, which I think is a really um, unique thing about the problem. Okay. So how, um, you know, that was one, or I guess I've shown a couple of time series now already of the diurnal warm layer. Um, here is a map that was put together by Clayson and Bogdanov. Um, this is just one day diurnal magnitude of the SST diurnal um, amplitude. Um, this was from 2005. Just for your reference, the Pricewell Pinkle data was taken about 25 years earlier off the coast of California here. But if you look at the map, you see, um, you know, there's a lot of variation in where you get a strong uh, change in temperature with the diurnal heating. However, in some of these places, we're up to nearly three degrees uh, Celsius in terms of the warming signal. And so that's, that's substantial. Um, and this variability, of course, largely depends on what the winds are doing in any given in location, as well as what the solar heating looks like. Um, as just another example, I think if I click one more slide, yeah, I just this is the record that I showed that Arely worked on earlier and the one that I'm going to be um, looking at in more detail later. This is actually um, from a paper by Hyode Seo um, looking at the Dynamo time series, the data from the shipper in black, and then he's plotting different model products um, in the colors over it. But if you look at the magnitude of the diurnal cycle during um, the suppressed phase of the MJO versus the active phase of the MJO, again, we are in excess of a degree Celsius in some cases during the suppressed phase. And then there's, um, you know, in hardly any diurnal cycle uh, during the active phase of the Madden Julian oscillation. And so, you know, why do we care about um, this temperature difference? And the one of the primary reasons in my mind is that it's a key player in the net flux of heat between the ocean and the atmosphere. So let me go back, if I can play that again. Hmm. This is just a sequence of images from that Clayson and Bogdanov paper. And it's showing now, instead of the SST diurnal signal, it's showing the um, impact to the surface heat flux. And so, you know, you can see it shifts around the globe as the local solar cycle changes in any given location. Um, and if you look at the magnitudes of it, there are patches where um, including the diurnal signal in SST uh, changes our net surface flux by almost 50 watts per meter squared. And so that's a substantial number in terms of the net surface heat flux. <clears throat> One way of looking at that is then um, they took uh, seasonal composites of a longer record. And so you see um, December, January, February, March, April, May, um, June, July, August, and September, October, November. And they've just, you know, averaged the effect of including the diurnal SST um, into the net surface heat fluxes. And, you know, most places, uh, it's, it's important in the tropics. Um, it can, you know, it's typically on the order of a few watts per meter squared, but there are places like the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal, where we're getting up in excess of um, 10 watts per meter squared over long-term averages um, in terms of what, um, what's happening here. And so just a quote from their paper, significant portions of the tropical oceans experience differences on a yearly average of up to 10 watts per meter squared. Regions with the highest climatological differences include the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. Okay. So how do we go about measuring this very near surface signature from a ship? Um, and, you know, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily a simple problem. And so here is an example again from the Dynamo project. And this is um, sort of a typical ship-based record of stratification shear and then turbulence. Um, so I'm plotting, or I'm not plotting it. This is a paper by um, Kandaga uh, Pugiani, who was also a postdoc at OSU, um, but he's plotting um, stratification in the upper panel, shear squared in the second panel, and then um, dissipation, turbulent kinetic energy dissipation in the lower panel as measured um, from a profiler off the fantail of the ship. Um, and 
you know, if you look particularly in this case at shear and um, turbulence, uh, the stratification actually does extend to the surface almost. And I'll talk in a moment about why that is. Um, but you'll see that, you know, we're missing the upper 10 meters in case of a profiler. Um, and then in the case of shear, this is from a whole mounted ADCP, acoustic Doppler current profiler, you are not getting, you know, the upper ocean really at all. Um, and so, you know, this is again showing the same um, active and break phases of the MJO that Hiode was plotting um, earlier. And you can see in some periods, there is definitely a strong diurnal cycle. These are the break periods, um, but we are not really sampling uh, the very shallow diurnal warm layers that develop during the day. And this is largely because off the fantail, um, we are influenced by the ship's wake and then any kind of velocity sensor in the hull of a ship will be um, influenced by the flow around the ship. So what do we do instead? <clears throat> well, um, for several projects, Dynamo included, so this is an image of the ship-based sampling that was included in the Dynamo experiments, which was focused on ARC interaction. Um, and you'll notice here, there is this uh, <clears throat> line for a near surface temperature conductivity chain. So we put a bow chain um, at the front of the ship, and the ship is pointed into the flow. And from that, we can get clean measurements near the surface of temperature stratification. And in this case, there are also fast thermistors mounted on the chain. And so from that, we can calculate the dissipation of thermal variance, um, which during stably stratified conditions, we can use to estimate the TKE dissipation rate, um, epsilon. And so um, here you see an image of the bow chain. This is all um, work from Aureli Mulan um, in 2018 JPO paper. And you can see the various sensors here. And at the base of the bow chain, there's a really heavy weight um, to keep it vertical. And then in this figure, she's plotting um, a typical profile off the back of the ship. So again, the ship is just pointed into the flow. So it's, there's not, you know, it's not moving fast or anything like that. Um, but even in that case, the upper, roughly 10 meters is contaminated by the wake of the ship. Um, and then here is a profile from the T-chain of temperature. And so you can see a very different uh, picture if you have those clean measurements. So one thing we don't get um, in the Dynamo setup is near surface velocity though. And so um, the OSU mixing group, uh, let's see, uh, developed a, a, a new platform that's been deployed, I guess, uh, we use this in some of the Bay of Bengal work and also in the Western Pacific, 2018 was maybe the first time. Um, this is called the Surf Otter. It's, it's basically just a large aluminum body, um, but it has this fin on it. And then there's a bridle associated with it. And the idea is, is that once it gets deployed, that bridle um, acts and the fin act like a kite and it pulls the whole system outboard from the ship, which um, this is a plot by Ken Hughes. Uh, he's showing that schematically here. And so the Surf Otter is flying outboard of the ship's wake. Its fin has a variety of sensors on it, CTD sensors, but also sensors for measuring, um, again, uh, the temperature variance at very high uh, frequency. So we can get an estimate of chi and epsilon. Um, and here you can see the surf otter kind of just hanging out outboard of the, of the ship wake with a bird on it. There's also um, in the hull of it, there's a a little mini well for an acoustic Doppler current profiler. And so we're able to get velocity shear within a few meters of the surface um, using the system. And then, you know, depending on deployment, we can also deploy a chain below it. And so you can actually get uh, deeper measurements of um, CTDs and, and also turbulent sensors. Okay, so what, what do these near surface measurements provide? Um, well, we can look at the evolution of the stratification for one thing. So here again, it's just one day from the Dynamo experiment. You can see the net surface um, heat flux. So we have cooling at night. Um, daybreak is a little bit before this. However, it takes a little while before we actually get net warming at the sea surface. And so um, here you see warming and then cooling. And then if you just look at the time series development of the temperature structure, um, during this day, you can see we're starting with very uniform temperature conditions. 
um, the signal is first detected at the very near surface, just the uppermost sensor in this case. Uh, and then you can see continued heating through the day um, that eventually starts to um, mix downward. Um, something to note is that the temperature structure, it's primarily like an exponential shape during the early day through actually a lot, a lot of the day. And it's not until you start to get convective billows that you tend to see this um, classical tanch uh, shape profile. Um, this is a case again for weak winds. And so the accompanying turbulence um, here is a full record from a Rayleigh's paper of just five days where we saw a strong diurnal cycle. This is the same image I showed earlier where I was just showing the temperature that she had um, plotted from the ship. So again, we have net surface flux in the uppermost panel. Um, here's the winds. And so you see that really weak <clears throat> wind day on October 9th. Um, and then um, the second or the third panel down is now, you know, since these are actually time series measurements at set depths, uh, you know, once you remove the wave, surface wave signal, she's just plotting those time series data so you can see some of the detail. And so, you know, she's plotting um, the surface most signal here, SST. Um, I think this was from the sea snake. This was a floating thermistor at about 10 centimeters at the surface of the ocean. And then going down to a little over six meters. Um, and you can see warming at the near surface signal that then um, propagates downward in depth. And in some cases, the signal, you know, is not reaching deeper regions, meaning six meters until fairly late in the day. Um, second panel is showing the stratification at the various sensors. Um, this is, you know, from her interpolated background temperature profiles, uh, but, um, you know, pretty small interpolation space between the sensors. And then the panel here is showing the inferred turbulent kinetic energy dissipation rate. And so again, this is inferred from a measurement of the thermal variance dissipation chi, because that's what we're measuring. And you can see um, for most of these days, uh, one of the most dramatic features is that, so she's marking here in yellow, sunrise is actually at the start of the yellow patch, but you don't get net heating into the ocean until the end of the darker yellow patch. And then this period is the period of warming during the day. And then similarly, you start to see cooling at the surface a little bit before sunset. And then sunset's actually at the end of the yellow patch. And, you know, in early in the morning, the first thing we note is a dramatic decrease in the turbulent dissipation rate. It drops a couple orders of magnitude in the very shallowest sensors. Um, throughout the uh, heating cycle, you see low turbulence in the um, upper part of the ocean. And then through the course of the day, it starts to asymptote um, up to um, a steady value. Um, what else? In this dark line, she's plotting the Lombardo and Gregg scaling for nighttime convection conditions. Um, and that's just noted here. And so, you know, our values are asymptoting to that uh, scaling assumption. So she thought about, she wanted to look in a little more detail at the very shallow record. So this is um, the dissipation rate and stratification at the two meter record. Um, and so again, now you're seeing just a composite of the heating cycle over those few days. Um, she's plotting the solar radiation in the thinner line. And so you can see again, sunrise and sunset. Here is the stratification from the various days, the color marked here. And then here is an inset for the ninth. So this is the day that had that really warm signal. And she's doing this because there's some indication that we're actually seeing at the very near surface, um, a buildup of stratification uh, prior to nut surface heating, um, just due the, to the penetrating uh, radiation influence of the solar. Um, component. And if you look at the dissipation, so now she's taking that two meter dissipation rate from each of the days and just plotting them all on the same axes. Um, you'll see that uh, marked decline and near the surface 
signal of turbulence. So this is suppression by the, the onset of um, buoyancy, temperature uh, buoyancy. And you also see some hint that it maybe starts prior to the net um, warming of the ocean, but it's, it's most dramatic after that period. And then over the next few hours, we ramp back up um, in terms of the dissipation rate, and then it starts to seemingly asymptote um, in time. In the lower panel, she's just plotting the frequency of occurrence of kind of um, sharp temperature ramps that are seen in the higher resolution signal. And so it's really later in the day that we start to see strong um, what could be shear instabilities. It's, it's hard to say we didn't have shear data here, but um, you get a ramp-like structure. Okay. I think I covered everything I wanted to hear. So one of the things Aureli did is she she kind of started with a simple um, TKE balance where it's just the um, local rate of change of the turbulent kinetic energy balanced by shear production, um, buoyancy production, and then the dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. And this is following a paper by Bill Smythe that looked at buoyancy suppression associated with rain layers on the ocean. Um, and then, you know, he developed just a really simple scaling for this equation and then assuming that the buoyancy flux is uh, proportional to mixing efficiency times the dissipation rate, you can come up with um, uh, this equation. And then in the case of steady state, so again, Aurelie is thinking about this period where we start to asymptote um, the dissipation measurements, this equation reduces to the following. Um, and you know, scaling the shear uh, according to the friction velocity associated with the wind stress um, and scaling the um, turbulent kinetic energy, uh, just using that same frictional velocity, she can come up with an expression for the dissipation. And in this plot, that's what she's doing. She's plotting that um, uh, steady state solution and comparing it to the observed dissipation rate over this time region. And you can see that they collapse quite nicely. Okay, so that was talking about the stratification um, and then the turbulent signal that was observed in the very near surface. What about the shear? And so now I'm going to pull in work from Ken Hughes. I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Um, hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, so this is, these are data collected from that surf otter system, which we're getting very near surface measurements, um, uh, up a few meters in this case of the um, shear. And so here is, uh, this is data from the Western Pacific. It's off equator. Um, I am blanking on the latitude. I think it was about 15 north though. Um, you can see the incoming solar radiation. Here he's oriented the this is now wind speed and he's he's oriented it so um, his coordinate system is such that the cross he has a he's minimizing a crosswind component and so you can see v is near zero um, this is again the wind speed and then um, the a long uh, wind component um, is is shown here u and then he's oriented the um, ocean velocity in the same way. And he's plotting here the a long wind component of shear in the ocean um, in the upper panel, and then the crosswind component um, in the lower panel. And what's nice about these data in, in part is that you can see this inertial turning associated with the Coriolis force. Um, so the contours here are the temperature stratification. He's just showing that the region of maximum shear is consistent with the location of the region of maximum um, temperature stratification. Um, and if you start with just a, a simple model that is considers the um, time rate of change of the momentum is just in response to the wind stress and um, the Coriolis uh, force, you can solve this equation. Um, if you wanted to solve it completely, you would need to develop an expression for H as well, the, the depth of the layer. However, in our case, um, we were just considering what's the relative ratio of the along wind stress component to the cross wind stress component. And so you can uh, calculate that ratio just from that simple setup um, in itself, and you get um, you get this expression when you do that. So the crosswind component is 
um, proportional to the long wind component um, weighted by um, these parameters that depend on, on the latitude, as well as the time. Um, so when you take the measurement. Uh, let's see. And so here he's just kind of validating that we do indeed see that in our measurements. Here you see, um, again, the uh, wind speed and his coordinate system. So again, he's trying to minimize uh, the crosswind component. And in, in each of these cases, you see it's near zero, although on this day, there is a strong shifting of the winds. Um, in this panel, he's plotting the shear. So we have um, the measured uh, a long wind component in gray here, the low pass filter to that in black. So this is the long wind component of the um, measured oceanic uh, shear. And then in the bottom, he's plotting the measured a crosswind component and the solid line. And then he's using that expression on the previous slide and the a long wind component in the dashed line. So you can see that his um, simplified expression for the relationship between the long wind and a crosswind velocity as well as shear um, is consistent with what we're measuring in most cases. There's some deviation on the sixth, um, but it's, it's doing a pretty good job of modeling the observed shear. Okay, so um, something else we can look at when we start to measure shear is um, the Richardson number and starting to think a little bit more about um, the type of instabilities that we're seeing. So here again, our data from the Western Pacific. Um, this In each of these plots, he's plotting stratification on the um, left, he's plotting shear in the middle panel, and then this is a metric of the um, Richardson number, the shear squared minus 4n squared. So when this is zero, you have the critical um, Richardson value of a quarter. Um, if you look at each of set of panel is from a different day, and so on the uppermost panel, these are what he calls low winds, and so the winds are really below two and a half meters per second. Um, these other three cases are moderate wind days. They have winds of about five meters per second. Um, and the, you know, in the low wind day, we aren't really, even with our surf otter, we're not resolving the near surface shear. Um, and so can't really say much about it. However, if you look at the Richardson number, um, in the case of the moderate wind days, you can see that the values are fluctuating around that critical Richardson value. Um, so they're, you know, the colors are blue and yellow and going back and forth, um, which is maybe suggestive of marginal instability in the system. Um, and then kind of just to look at that in a little more detail, here he's plotting the, um, for each day, in these uh, moderate wind cases, the fifth, sixth, and seventh. Um, this is the um, histogram of shear squared minus four n squared. And you can see in some of the cases um, that, that we maybe um, are kind of fluctuating about that uh, critical value. Okay, um, and so I think thinking about this just a little bit more, um, so the diurnal warm layer structure, we've already talked about this. It depends strongly on the wind layer strength or the wind strength. Um, and so here um, is again, a comparison of a calm, moderate and windy day now in this case. Um, the top panels can is plotting again, the solar radiation. So you can see there is some variation there. And then the black line is showing the wind speed on the left. And so again, the calm day, we have very weak wind, moderate day, we're getting up close to five meters per second. And then in this case, we're calling windy um, just, you know, eight meters per second. So it's, uh, I guess that's always a relative statement. Um, but you can see the um, resultant temperature structure. So the contours here showing the measured temperature plotted um, color scale here. In all cases, he's referencing the temperature to whatever the value was at dawn. And so you can see, you know, it's going from zero to the perturbation um, in the diurnal warm layer. And then um, in these lower panels, he's plotting the temperature stratification. And so this is just comparing the structure of a calm day, a moderate day, and a windy day. And you can note there's a very different um, character to the, um, to the stratification. Turns out there's a different character to the mixing as well. Um, the high frequency 
plots in the foreground on the spatum panel, those are showing the temperature at um, using our 100 hertz signals. Uh, he's maybe plotting them at um, a slightly reduced frequency than that. So those are the fast thermistor temperature signals. And so you can kind of infer some of these wiggles as a signature of turbulence. Um, what else did I want to say about that? If you look at the magnitude of the temperature in each of these cases, and we saw this before in some of the background material, you can see the maximum delta T that's measured and um, depends strongly on winds. And there's a fall off as you go from windy to moderate. There's some kind of hint here that once you get to calm conditions, um, you, you can get some variation in the magnitude of that temperature signal. And so, um, in a few slides, I'm going to talk about uh, what I mean by calm conditions. Okay, so if you then look, these are the same three days, again, the surface conditions in the top panel, and then the contours here, he's plotting um, the temperature gradient. Um, and then on top now, these kind of interesting bar records, these are the measures, this is the measure of dissipation from each of the fast thermistors um, deployed on the surf otter in, in these three cases. Um, he chose to plot it in sort of an interesting way. Um, it's showing the ratio of the measured um, dissipation or the inferred dissipation from the um, thermistors to um, the uh, the scaling that um, epsilon star is just u star cubed over kappa z. Um, and so, for example, early in the day, the measured epsilon is um, typically less than that scaling. And it's not oops, until later in the day that you start to see the measured value of dissipation increase um, above that scaling. Um, right. So he looked a little more carefully at this idea of um, marginal instability. And it turns out that during the moderate um, wind periods, we often see values where four N squared is about the same as the shear squared. However, um, the turbulence is uh, not very notable until later in the day. Um, and so he wanted to look at this in a little more detail. So here is a collection of images. Let me see if I can just walk you through these plots. So um, this is a moderate wind day that he's plotting. So here is the development of temperature um, you know, that's progressing through local time. So for example, earlier in the day, there's weak stratification that builds um, as, as we warm during the day. Um, what else is plotted? Here he has the downwind. Um, this is the ocean velocity component here. And so the color scale is the same. You can see the development of the diurnal jet as we go through the day. And then the um, as the Coriolis force uh, inertially steers that, you see that change through the course of the day as well. And then in these panels, he's plotting four in squared in the dashed line, and then shear squared in the solid line. And he's doing it for, he's averaging over different periods of the day. This is from 10 to 11, 14 to 1500, 16 to 1700, and then 18 to 1900. Um, and so you can see if you just look at the magnitudes of four and squared to shear squared, except for some periods, for example, in the near surface here, those two plots are overlining with one another. And so here's just a quote from Ken's paper. Um, we observe low Richardson numbers of around 0.1 in the top two meters between 10 and 1600 local time, um, which is roughly four hours after sunrise to two hours before sunset. Despite Richardson number being well below um, the one quarter threshold, sorry, I don't, I don't, that's supposed to be a divided by, um, instabilities do not grow quickly. And so Ken wanted to look at this in a little more detail and he has a publication from 2021 that does so. He did that by considering both linear stability analysis and here's just one excerpt from that paper looking at that here. And, and he basically took you know, um, smooth versions of the temperature and the shear that are observed. And then he artificially shifted them downward from uh, the surface um, in his linear stability analysis in this particular plot. And so the idea is he wanted to understand what that um, rigid surface was doing to the growth rates of the instabilities. 
Um, and here he's plotting uh, the, you know, the peak growth rate from the linear stability analysis as a function of that artificially shifting downward of delta Z. And what you can see as you move away from the surface, the growth rates increase um, rapidly. And then in the lower panels, he's showing um, the development of the instability at 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, again, for different values of delta Z. Um, and so you can compare what happens in terms of a um, perturbation at um, you know, a stratification layer that's very near the surface versus one that um, starts to shift away from the surface. As another piece of that paper, he um, used some idealized uh, high resolution two-dimensional simulations with the MIT GCM. And here's a nice little YouTube movie that he's put together. Um, he's actually, you should watch what's written on the slide here because that's Ken um, explaining what's happening. Um, he initializes it at 4 a.m. with isothermal conditions. The sun rises, you'll start to see the temperature stratification increase. And then you're gonna also note that the um, background velocity starts to change. The third panel, he's plotting shear squared minus four n squared, and then you can see the simulation and the um, uh, of the temperature. So you know, for the most of the day, you see these perturbations, but they're they're really not developing into large billows um, and overturns until um, very late in the day when uh, convection at the surface starts to be a factor, and we start to see downward mixing. And so, um, you know, Ken does a lot more in terms of evaluation of um, these perturbations in this 2021 paper. So I, I encourage you to look it up and, and, and read it if you're interested. And then here we're progressing to that state that um, Priceweller Pinkel noted as, you know, resetting the system to the next day. Okay, I don't know why that's the second one. All right, so what are the consequences of the turbulence? Money, I'm not watching the chat, although I see some, I don't know. Um, please interrupt me if I'm missing something. Yeah, there here, are no questions at this point. Okay, great. Um, here yeah. again, we have the calm, moderate, and windy days. Um, at the top is just um, the temperature stratification at two depths, 0.4, and then two meters, so pretty close to the surface. Um, and then moderate and windy. In the second panel, he's plotting the measured um, turbulent flux at those locations. And so again, um, you know, this delay in the um, moderate day that he's noting at, at four meters, um, you really don't start to see a strong turbulent flux until fairly late in the day. Um, and then the bottom panel is showing uh, the major components of the heat budget. Um, Black is showing the divergence of that turbulent heat flux. And so there's periods where um, at the different depths, I can't, I think that this is at the two meter depth that he's plotting. Um, I have trouble remembering, apologies, and I can't see if it's plotted there. But you know, it, initially um, the divergence is one sign and then we flip to the other sign. So turbulence is acting um, to warm the ocean uh, further down as, as, um, as the diurnal warm layer starts to deepen. The other components that are important are the solar radiative component, because again, we're very near the surface. And so that's plotted in the dashed line. And then the observed actual tendency of heat is plotted in the um, in the solid line. And, you know, for the moderate wind days, it's really a balance of these three terms that is the major, um, are the major players in the upper ocean heat budget. Um, in the case of the very light wind days, turbulence isn't doing much. And so here we're going to get to the, the, um, the idea of, of where might, we're maybe in a laminar regime or close to one um, for, for this particular case. Um, okay. And so um, just another way of looking at that um, data here, he's taking a variety of um, turbulent heat flux profiles um, on moderate wind days only. Uh, he scaled them by where the maximum and stratification is, as well as what the maximum turbulent flux was. So they're all kind of normalized. Um, but the reason he did this is because um, it points out that same um, 
this is going back again to the Price Weller Pinkel paper, who noted this really characteristic vertical structure and the stratification in shear um, that had this distinct med depth, the maximum. And, and this is a way of noting that above that maximum, turbulence is acting um, to cool, and below it, um, uh, we have warming conditions. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Um, the other thing to note is that his values of um, turbulent dissipation that, uh, or turbulent heat flux, sorry, that are being measured are consistent with those that Price, Weller, Pinkel inferred um, just from the evolution of temperature, about 100 watts per meter squared um, on moderate wind days. And again, that's kind of consistent with, with the PWP observations. Great. Okay. Um, so what did I want to say about this? You know, again, the reason we care about this is because, or one of the reasons we care about this is because it has this influence to the net surface heat um, flux. But, you know, it's really the cases that have very strong temperature perturbations that are contributing to these um, mean signals. And so, you know, we want to learn what we can from the, the calm wind conditions as well, because those are the ones where you see very strong um, perturbations in delta T. And so one of the nice things that Ken did in one of his papers was he thought about this, this signal where, you know, there's not a lot of data here, but there's some hint that once you drop below two meters per second and the wind speed, you start to see these really strong values of um, temperature in the diurnal warm layer. Um, and, and he's not the only one that's noted this. Here's just one other example from Gentman et al. 2009, where she's taken many days of um, measurements of the diurnal warm layer. Um, and she's plotting the temperature just versus wind speed. And so you can see that you're getting these strong signals really when your winds are below two meters per second, just looking at her color scale here. And then, you know, there are several other publications that kind of call out this roughly two meter per second um, wind um, criteria. And so one of the things that Ken did in one of his earlier papers was he, he considered just a really simple balance um, as well as his inertially veering ratio for the along wind and crosswind components. And so if you look at the kinetic energy in the diurnal um, jet, just u squared plus v squared over two, um, you can use these relationships to come up with an expression that depends on the wind speed, the layer depth, um, the Coriolis force and, and your time scale because it deepens through the day. Um, you can also write an expression for the buoyancy input by the net surface flux. And he recognized that if you just equate those two pieces, so the kinetic energy from um, winds, the buoyancy input from uh, solar heating, you can take this expression, you can um, insert uh, wind speed instead of wind stress. And you can solve for what, you know, he termed a critical wind speed. And that's just when the kinetic energy and the potential energy or buoyancy input are balanced from one another. And once you do that, you get this expression. Um, all of these factors are scaled by this one quarter power. And so, you know, he picked a few select um, values for these and then plotted you know, the range or the sensitivity of this U critical to the various parameters over here. So here he's plotting, you know, what you pick for your time scales. He's doing anything from three to seven hours, which again, we're thinking about a diurnal cycle. So those are a pretty large range of reasonable values versus the incoming heat flux. Um, and if you look at his color scale, the difference in U critical that you get over that range is, is not very much, right? This is just going from 1.4 meters per second up to um, less than three meters per second. Um, and you can do that for any one of the parameters. Here's his dependence on latitude, looking from zero to 60 north, um, and, and then the depth, um, which is maybe the most variable. But again, this is these are shallow diurnal warm layers where this is at play. So within you know a wide range of plausible input values, U critical is within plus or minus thirty percent of this two meters per second. So we you know consider it a convenient rule of thumb for when you might um, expect more laminar conditions in the diurnal warm layer. 
Okay, so I'm going to close. I think I'm okay time wise still. Um, have just a little bit of time by shifting gears to the Bay of Bengal. Um, and there are a couple of things that make it a little unique and shift away from this idealized case I've been talking about. Um, here are data from a record in um, 2015. This was a float that was profiling up and down in the northern Bay of Bengal. You can see the net surface flux up here in gray. Um, the black line is showing the turbulent flux, um, I think averaged over the upper 25 meters, if I recall correctly. Second panel is showing the wind stress and the SST. And then you see the temperature in the third panel, the salinity in the fourth panel. And then this is the temperature gradient the um, turbulent diffusivity measured from thus thermistors, and then the um, turbulent heat flux in the lower panel. And I guess what I want to point out in this, I don't want to talk too much about the details of it, um, but if you look at the temperature record, we know the bay is characterized by, um, well, I guess look at the salinity record first, uh, strong salinity stratification in the air surface, and you see strong gradients in that salinity stratification and in, in time in this case, but that's also means strong gradients in the horizontal. Um, and because it's salinity stratified, you can actually get pretty complicated um, background temperature structures. So this idea of a uniform upper ocean um, kind of falls apart, right? Look at these subsurface warm layers um, that uh, for moderate to windy days will influence the um, diurnal warm layer. Similarly, you have very near surface salinity stratification. Here we see um, a fresh layer, uh, you know, surfacing. And so all of this is going to um, alter our vision of the simple 1D uh, diurnal warm layer. Currently, Sid, who's a student with Emmett Tandon at University of Massachusetts, is thinking about this a little more carefully, also in the context of um, the monsoon interseasonal oscillations. So Sid is looking at data from 2019. Here he's showing an SST signal from a collection of drifters and buoys that were out in the bay. Um, you can see he's noting three different periods here. One is where we have kind of moderate winds and um, the diurnal cycles are getting up to those few tenths of a degree Celsius or Kelvin. Um, here uh, there are weak winds um, and you can see uh, SSTs um, getting perturbations up to a degree. And then during the um, active phase of the MISO, you see suppressed um, diurnal cycles. And so Sid is considering the connection between the MISO and the diurnal warm layers. This is from um, June, uh, no, July, sorry, um, of, of 2019. And so during this period, this is pre-period of Shirlika talked about um, just a little bit, I guess, in this case, or it's outside of the region where you get the strong riverine water. But what he is um, noting is that you do see the influence of precipitation. And so here is that same time record, um, again, showing moderate winds. Here you have low winds, although they do fluctuate a little bit, and then higher winds during the active phase. But if you look in this low wind phase, there's the signature of these atmospheric cold pool events. So here's air temperature. And with those cold pool events, you get these strong precipitation patches. And so Sid is thinking um, about what that salinity stratification um, does to the consequent diurnal warm layers and how that might um, influence the MISO. And then the other work I wanted to just highlight again was Rita Brada, who was a former ICTS student and he's now a postdoc at the University of Michigan. He is still um, working with the Kaipod record from 18 North that Shrilika showed when he has the time. Um, and one of the things he's looking at is uh, the diurnal cycle in it. So here he's plotting the net surface heat flux over a short period of time. Here is the westward wind stress in the gray patch. And here is the measured turbulence at 65 meters depth in black. And then on each of these, he's overlaying the mixed layer depth. It's just a metric so you can kind of see each day. But you can also see the shallowing of the mixed layer depth with the diurnal warming. Um, and what's interesting is that during this period, we have a very strong signal in turbulence that is well below the mixed layer depth. And so it's reminiscent of some of the deep cycle turbulence work that's done um, in the equatorial Pacific as well as Atlantic now. Um, 
And, um, you know, he's also thinking about, well, what we no longer have steady winds, we have winds that also have a diurnal cycle. And so how does that, um, how does that change our vision of the diurnal warm layer? Okay, I am done. Thanks. Thank you, Emily, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Are there any questions for Emily? There is a question from Jitendra. Uh, will there be increase in near surface temperature if there is consequent calm wind days due to diurnal yeah. warming? Yeah, so I didn't really talk about that, but um, I mean, if you have net zero surface flux and no background stratification, right, it should rectify each day. But um, uh, if you don't, if you have net warming through the course of the day, you will gradually build up temperature. And so in a lot of um, the plots that Ken did, for example, he was always resetting each night to the constant value of whatever the temperature was um, in the uh, nighttime uh, layer. And oh. Amit says you can see that in period two uh, that Sid's looking at as well. Yeah. Emily, I had a question, this is Sutano. So uh, you said that when you had this very calm wind, then uh, you got an almost laminar layer, right? Can you, you observe that? Yeah, it just doesn't deepen. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, that's, that's maybe too strong of a statement. Like, I, you know, I don't, it's maybe not laminar and we definitely don't have the shear measurements that close to the surface, but it doesn't deepen. Um, until later in the day when convection kicks in, really. Um, it stays very shallow. Um, yeah, we kind of noticed that in our LES too, but I've always wondered whether maybe because we were not resolving the near wall layer very accurately, therefore we were not getting the turbulence. That's possible as well, but, but if your turbulence isn't... So it might be turbulent very close to the surface, I think is what you're yes. saying, right? And so I, but we can't really measure that very well, right? Like, I mean, we we have our individual time series, I guess, um, but you know, it's not penetrating deep. And so even if it is turbulent there, the Delta T is still getting very high. And so I guess in terms of like what the impact is that two meter per second threshold is still relevant, right? But you're right, like the details very close to the surface are still up for debate, I think. Yeah, we need a DNS for that. Yeah, and at some point the waves start to matter, even yeah, though like, the it's, calm days, right? it's probably not, you know, the likelihood of breaking waves is probably fairly low, but I mean, waves are a remote signal, so um, in some cases they might become important. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Are there other questions? Great. So Emily, I had a question. The linear stability analysis uh, that you talked about, Ken Hughes's paper. Yeah. Th does, that, uh, th does that account for a time varying base flow? Or what kind of? No, so he did, he did a couple things. I just showed one of them. This one, it's just like, what's the, you know, peak growth rate. The other thing he did that I thought was kind of interesting is he took the evolving actual conditions through a day and then, you know, picked different periods for his background temperature and shear profiles and also did a linear stability analysis for those. And they show something similar to this. Um, and then, you know, to complement that, he did these uh, very high resolution 2D runs um, with MIT GCM. And, and he would let those, you know, evolve. Okay, thank you. There is another question in the chat box. Mm, from, yeah, uh, so that's a good question. And um, Ken looked at this as well in his stratified or his shear paper. So he didn't do it for diffusivity, actually, that I recall, but he did it for shear. 
um, and the behavior of the different parameterizations for what they did to the near surface shear. And it actually wasn't KPP. I'm trying to remember which one it was that behaved kind of most like reality. I'd have to go check that. It was his 2018 paper that looked at it. Um, but yeah, um, I'm thinking of things like KPP. Yes, that, that's my comments on that. I'd have to go look back at his paper to be more precise. Um, but they don't all behave the same that close to the surface. Are there other questions? So I had one basic question, Emily. You showed an animation of the surface heat flux over the global oceans right in the beginning. And there are uh, some spatial features that you see there. What are they? Uh, so this is, um, you know, so I took figures from this paper and composited them. So those are just locations, you know, my interpretation, those are locations where there are weak winds and strong solar heating um, on that particular day. Um, and so it's really just a measure of how large the values can get in terms of a, a day, um, right? And then going to the next one here, um, they've averaged over long seasonal periods, many days and many years, if I recall correctly as well. Um, so this is this is the um, kind of longer term effect of those signals. Okay. It's interesting. I mean, the Northern Indian Ocean stands out, right? So uh, there's lots of work maybe to do. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, I would like to thank uh, Emily for this uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. And